Uh, hey guys, this is a quick message that I just recorded today right before the episode to give you guys a heads up that last night there was a huge meltdown on social media between Miriam Klink and Tufi Luke. There's a lot of drama. Miriam Klink is accusing Tufi Luke of sexual harassment, of pedophilia. She's sharing a bunch of messages that people are sending her. They're trying to expose Tufi Luke. Tufi Luke is responding today. He's going to be releasing a video and doing a live and he's going on Al Jadid, etc., I'm observing the situation. I'm keeping my finger on all the information so that we can do a deep dive into the story next week. I didn't want to slap together an episode today. I usually shoot everything on Wednesdays. I wouldn't have had time to do an episode today, slap it together, edit it without getting a lot of the facts right. So a lot of these accusations are very serious and I want to take this video seriously. So give me a few days. Let's let the story develop a little bit. And next week, we're going to do a deep dive, a full deep dive on Tufiluk and the allegations. Uh, for, I didn't have time to do anything for today's episode, so enjoy that one. It's going to go off just in a few seconds. So I just wanted to give you guys that heads up. Uh, next week, we're doing Tufiluk. All right, enjoy the episode. Do not worry. Welcome to the fourth episode of Do Not Worry. I'm your host, Anthony, coming to you once again from the heart of Beirut and Jaitewe. Thank you so much for joining me. We have a very fun episode today. But before we get going, I'd like to ask you guys to take a second to like this video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. We just crossed 600 subscribers. We're aiming to cross a thousand subscribers. Also, a little fun fact, I am now officially unemployed. So to get this channel monetized, I need to hit a thousand subscribers. So when I ask you guys to subscribe, I'm being very serious, especially now. Uh, so I appreciate your support as always. Every like you guys leave, every comment, all engagement helps this video. It helps the channel because again, this is a brand new YouTube channel. So it all helps. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you guys for watching. Once again, we have a lot of fun topics to go through today, including anal COVID swabs. When they tell you to open wide, it's going to be, they're going to mean something very different now. Uh, we're going to talk about my favorite Lebanese stand-up comedians. I am going to ch touch on the Dana Hurani parody that I made a year ago. It's, we're going to celebrate the one-year anniversary, and I'm going to uncover some direct messages that we sent each other after the video, sort of the fallout of the video that, th that I did. And I'm also going to look through the Netflix top 10, give you guys some recommendations both on Netflix and off of Netflix. And if we still have some time, I'm going to talk about an influencer who I really love at the end of the episode. It depends on if we have too much to cover. Not to get depressing or not to get too serious or anything. I did just want to touch on the fact that I am currently unemployed. A, I just wanted to take a minute to say that I had an amazing job for three and a half years. I worked with, a, with some of the best people in the country. Hands down, I had an amazing boss. Honestly, the greatest CEO who I genuinely love. So I've been super fortunate to have an amazing job. And particularly throughout this last year, that has been so hard on a lot of people. A lot of people lost their jobs, got their salaries slashed. Uh, their salaries got devalued by like 80%. So the fact that I was able to work this entire year, save a bunch of money to prepare for this possibility of me being unemployed, um, I'm just very fortunate. And I'm trying my best to focus on the positives. A, that I've had an amazing job while other people didn't. I have some money saved up. And a lot of you might not know this, but I'm a US citizen. I'm an American citizen. I spent a third of my life in the United States. I also have an exit strategy. If things get really bad here, I can leave anytime I want. And again, I know how fortunate that makes me. I know how privileged I am to have this sort of ticket out of here in case I really need it. So while on one end, I, it's very scary to be unemployed, specifically during a global pandemic and a global recession and economic depression in many ways. And so many industries are hurting, whether it's like entertainment, restaurants, hotels, all that sort of thing. So... It is very scary, but it is also just a little bit exciting to know that I have so many possibilities ahead of me. And yeah, it is scary though. And, and, and not to say that I couldn't empathize with other people before. Most of my best friends, my family members, my, my, my relatives, my cousins were affected by this situation, whether by losing their jobs, getting their salaries affected. So I have felt this from the beginning, but now I can doubly empathize. I can empathize even more because I'm in the same boat with everyone. And I'm very lucky to be able to say that I'm not too worried. Do not worry is the name of the show. I understand that a lot of people are not as fortunate as I am. 
And I know this is a weird thing to talk about, me being unemployed on a podcast that's supposed to be light and fun. I just don't want to hide anything from you guys. I want to be honest. If me being open about this can help some of you guys feel a little bit less shitty about being unemployed, hey, we're in the same boat, buddy. Sponsors, if you're watching, you're looking to sponsor your boy, send me an email, send me a message. It's time to clean your assholes, folks, because anal swabs are coming. Uh, so according to a bunch of articles, and like I'm reading a Forbes article right now, China deploys anal swab tests to detect high-risk COVID-19 cases. Mm, you heard that right, folks. So according to the article, as Chinese authorities struggle to contain rising COVID-19 infections ahead of the Lunar New Year celebrations, Beijing has introduced anal swabs as a new type of coronavirus test that could detect the virus more accurately. State-run CCTV reported that the tests are reserved for high-risk cases, although there does not appear to be a coordinated policy for them, with the reports of surprise tests for some individuals. Can you imagine that kind of fucking surprise? Like you just landed and you have to get a surprise anal swab test? This includes passengers arriving in Beijing, residents of quarantine centers, and, according to local officials, a group of more than 1,000 school children and teachers believed to be exposed to the virus. This is, I'm, don't do that to school children. Leave the children out of this, man, please. Uh, the test involves inserting a cotton-tipped swab about one to two inches into the rectum, which will then be tested for the virus. Anal swab tests could be more accurate than nose or throat tests, said Li Tongzheng, deputy director of the Respiratory and Infectious Diseases Department at Beijing UN Hospital, in an interview with state media. Li said studies show that the virus lasts longer in the anus or excrement then in the respiratory tract, and that an anal test could be better at identifying the disease in milder asymptomatic cases. Whew! All right. Um, that sounds fun. Look, I've, I've only gotten the COVID test once, and it really wasn't that bad. Tested negative, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, fucking anal test? I'm not down for this shit. I'm going to be honest with you, man. I'm not, and this is going to make people less likely to get tested. So I'm glad that it's only reserved for sort of extreme cases because good luck convincing the general population, especially here in Lebanon, who, you know, let's, let's, let's get real. They're not going to want any anal swab tests. Uh, there's another funny article that I found that says, anal swab COVID test won't make you waddle like a penguin, China says. Like, I'm glad, I'm so, it's so funny that they had to clarify that no, you're not going to waddle like a penguin. when It's just one to two inches in the rectum. Anyways, it just sounded like a weird... A uh, fun topic to talk about. I'm not looking forward to these. I hope they stay in China. But anyways, clean those assholes, guys. Make sure they're ready. I almost forgot. This topic was sent to me by a viewer on Instagram. I tried to track you down, dude, uh, through the DMs. I couldn't find your name. Please reveal yourself in the comments, whoever sent me this topic. Thank you. It was a lot of fun to talk about. And if you guys have any topics that you want to send me, please feel free to send me a message, a DM. Leave it in the comments. Uh, I look at all your comments. I read everything you guys send me and I really appreciate all the engagement and anytime someone sends me anything, I'm super thankful. But please remind me, write your name in the comments, dude. Thank you so much for sending me this. Exactly, almost exactly one year ago today, I released a parody video of Dana Hurani's now infamous Do Not Worry clip that she released. And it kind of went viral and it was me basically just making fun of the video that she had made because it just seemed so out of touch, so aloof. I know she meant well and her heart was in the right place, but it just honestly felt like she was living on Mars and she was making like this video and it just didn't sit right with me and with a lot of other people. I just wanted to take a few moments to discuss the aftermath of that video because I never really shared what happened. As far as people know, I think the video went viral and everyone forgot about it the next day, except me who has been obsessed with it and I even started a podcast based on the name. Thanks again, Dana. But I want it in celebration of the video turning one and celebrating Dana's sort of influence on me and on this podcast, weirdly enough. I wanted to tell you guys what happened after the video. And while the video was like going, being shared on the day a year ago, I was getting a whole bunch of messages from people who knew Dana personally, who were telling me that she was extremely upset at the video because not only did I make a video, people were commenting about her video for like two days, two, three days before I released my video. So she was already getting a bunch of just comments and people making fun of her and shit like that. I'm sure a lot of them were just harmless jokes and teasing, but I'm also sure a lot of people were just being assholes. So, and my video kind of came at the tail end. I think she thought she was done with the controversy. And then like my video just like, bam, just smacked 
her in the face, not no violence against women, just sort of figuratively. And I think she took it hard. So a bunch of people who knew her sent me messages like, listen, dude, hilarious video, but she's a really nice person. She didn't mean it to be interpreted like that. And now she's like really sad, et cetera, et cetera. And I also got insight that her sister, and I'm not making fun of you or anything, but her sister was sending DMs and reaching out to people who were making fun of Dana, being like, you guys are assholes. Stop making fun of my sister, et cetera. While I don't agree with sort of that tactic of reaching out to people via DMs and like bashing them for, for critiquing a video. I respect her sister for looking out for her sister and being like, hey, stop making fun of my fucking sister. I respect that. I got nothing against that. But it seemed like Dana was taking it hard. So I decided to reach out and to actually send Dana a direct message. And I'm going to read it to you guys right now. So I basically send Dana. Hey, I hope you're doing okay. I just wanted to say that the video is just meant as a parody. I don't mean to hurt your feelings or be a bully. I just thought it would be a funny video that would make people laugh. I have absolutely no ill will towards you. I just recently found out about you through your video. I admire the fact that you want to help and I don't want to deter you from doing so. I don't even think you'll get to see this, but I wanted to reach out. If my video hurt you, I do apologize. My intent was solely to make something funny. Have a good night. To her credit, she responded rather quickly. And she sends me a long DM and I'm going to read it to you. She says, hi, Anthony, I appreciate you reaching out. Of course, I would see this message just as I saw the attacks written to me and about me in the last three days. I understand and respect that you are into parodies, but please bear in mind that if you don't believe you are a bully, please do believe that you are paving the way for bullies to comment on and share your video in a way you might not have expected. Yes, I have been hurt by this and I only tell you this to consider in your future parodies that there is a person behind the screen. Anyways, what's done is done. Take care. So I appreciated her message, but I, I did. I, I don't like the bully argument because it's an easy way to deflect. And if you notice, Ingrid just did that recently when her dog video went viral. She's like, okay, I fucked up, but like the comments, everyone's bullying me. Same with Dana. Dana didn't do anything wrong. It was just a stupid video. But again, it was just like, whoa, the comments, everyone's bullying me. It's a good way to sort of deflect attention away from you and onto the mean comments that you're getting. Um, well, I don't fully agree with that. I do agree with her that some people do use my videos or any video to bully people, even if the artist, or the creator did not intend for it to be insulting. Same, same thing happened when I made the Nimmer videos. People were sharing them and like tagging, like, fuck you, Nimmer. Like, I never meant to insult Nimmer. I just made a Nimmer parody. Same with Dana. I just wanted to do something funny, but then some people took it farther and probably tagged her and were like, you fucking dumb bitch or whatever. And I get why that would be upsetting. I just don't want to be associated with that, but I get it. I then respond to Dana again. I say, I agree that some people are definitely way more intense than I had imagined. And I wasn't aware of the three day barrage of messages you were getting. I really would hate for you to take it personally. It was very much inspired by your video, but wasn't meant to hurt you or attack you personally. Although I understand that it might be used by people who are doing that. I'm sorry for that, but I also saw so much support and kind words. So that made me happy. Um, anyways, I went on too long. Take care and good night. And I sincerely am sorry. I was not even expecting this. Now, Dana did respond to this DM. And I remember her ending us ending our conversation with her basically saying, thank you for reaching out. I do appreciate it. She has deleted that DM. I can't show it to you. She went back and deleted it. And Dana, I know you deleted that message. I don't know why. Maybe so that I don't think that it ended positively. So that if I ever were to look back on it, I would feel bad. I do specifically remember you DMing me and telling me, thank you for reaching out. It's weird that you would go and delete it. I'm glad I still have that first DM. So I, I screenshotted everything a couple days ago. But that is sort of what happened with Dana. Um, I never heard from, a sis from her sister. She never reached out to me. I wanted to reach out directly to Dana. Some people were like, you shouldn't have reached out or you don't ever have to do that. It's not your job. It's not your responsibility. I kind of disagree. I, I didn't want to hurt her feelings because I know her heart was in the right place. I know she made that video out of love. Whether it was a, a stupid video, was it very ill-informed? Was it very out of touch? Absolutely. But her heart was definitely in the right place. And I don't want to discourage people from helping, even if their idea of help is kind of silly. So... That's that little piece of history on the video. Let me know if you guys enjoyed it. Did you guys like the parody that I did a year ago? What did you think of Dana's original video? Now for the main piece of today's episode, the main topic. 
me breaking down my five favorite Lebanese stand-up comedians. What I like about this is that if you go five years in the past, and if I were to walk around the street holding a microphone and sort of interviewing people who are walking around, and if I were to ask them five years ago, who's your favorite Lebanese stand-up comedian? I almost guarantee you that 90% of my answers would have been Nimr, 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 Nimr. Because he's kind of like the only one who was doing it. He was the only one promoting himself heavily. And he was kind of the face of stand-up comedy in Lebanon. Fast forward five years today, if you were to ask that question, I guarantee you wildly different answers. Because we now have a bunch of talented comics that are doing it. And they're doing it great. And why has stand-up comedy exploded in Lebanon in the, in the last five years? I don't know the reasons for that. If I were to guess, I would say because... As the situation has gotten worse and worse, maybe we recognize our need to laugh more and more um, with social media kind of making it easier for people to share their comedy. We have people like Awkward Comedy giving uh, stand-up comics and wannabe stand-up comics a space where they can go and experiment and share their content on stage. Uh, little bars and restaurants are doing more and more open mics and stuff like that. So the industry has really gone up and stand-up comedy has become a very popular thing in Lebanon. So... I wanted to take a few minutes and just talk about my five favorite Lebanese stand-up comics in no particular order. So it's just going to be uh, ad hoc. And I'm going to start with someone that I've already talked about on the show, Wissam Kamal. I mentioned him on episode two as one of my favorite Lebanese influencers. But Wissam, as I mentioned before, to me is the face of stand-up comedy in Lebanon. To me, he's the guy who is the biggest ambassador for stand-up comedy. And he's been working so hard. Again, whether you think he's hilarious or not he's just such a hard worker and he is hilarious and he's such a nice dude that I honestly love Wissam Kamal and I've seen him I think I've seen him perform the most he's done so many openings for people he's always there he's either hosting an event or or he's just always around I love him I think Wissam is easily and comfortably in my top five best Lebanese stand-up comics another one of my favorite comics is Noor Hajar, and I've talked about him as well on another episode. I think Noor is really funny for multiple reasons. A, his videos on Instagram are hilarious. I think Noor understands the Lebanese audience and like the common Lebanese person better than anyone. And I don't mean that in like from an elitist perspective. I really think he understands people and he's giving, honestly, a voice to underrepresented communities in Lebanon. And I really like that. And his comedy is getting a little bit more political, a little bit more biting. He's great. And just like Wissam, I think he's a fantastic ambassador for stand-up comedy. He's absolutely killing it. Uh, his Instagram account keeps growing. So I really like Nuh Hajar. I really respect him. And I'm very eager to see where he takes his comedy next. So he's comfortably as well in my top five. Another of my favorite stand-up comics is uh, Shaden. Now, I, is her real last name Esperanza? I don't know. But Shaden. If your last name is Esperanza, that's very cool. But Shaden is fucking... Hilarious. Again, I think she brings a very important and interesting perspective to stand-up comedy, given sort of her, her background. Again, she kills it on Instagram with these hilarious videos that make light of extremely serious situations like mental health and uh, like Israeli warplanes flying overhead. She can make anything funny. She's hilarious. I've seen her live a couple of times. She brings the house down every time. Again, easily deserves a spot as one of Lebanon's funniest stand-up comics. Uh, this other stand-up comic I want to talk about, you guys might not know him. He's pretty underrated. He's pretty new. I know him personally from high school. His name is Karl Dagir. Karl, I like a lot because he has a very dry and sort of witty sense of humor that a lot of people might not get. But what I like about Karl is that his, his comedy will always make the right people laugh. I think there's a term in stand-up comedy that is like playing to the back of the room where like you're making a joke that maybe the general audience doesn't understand but the comics in the room all understand carl is that kind of comic he is a he's a comics comic i think he hasn't had that many opportunities to perform yet i haven't seen him perform that much but i've seen a lot of his stuff on twitter on instagram personally being around him i know he's fucking hilarious so um i think he deserves a spot on that list and i think the more people that get to know him you'll agree with me Finally, I'm going to talk about another stand-up comic. Her name is Natalie Aukad. Natalie doesn't live in Lebanon anymore. Natalie moved to New York to pursue her dream of stand-up comedy. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be a friend of Natalie's. I actually introduced Natalie to Wissam Kamal. It's a, um, I feel very proud of putting these two great minds together. I fucking love Natalie, man. A, I just admire her so much for leaving the country, moving to New York, and fucking hustling ass, man, to, to fucking make it. 
Um, it is super hard to be a fucking stand-up comic in New York. Let me tell you that. And I feel very fortunate to have actually seen her perform in New York in one of those like little shitty bars, like getting her start and hustling. And like, I forgot this thing she did. She was like, you stand outside the bar, you try to get people to come in. It was called like barking or like dog walking or dog barking, something like that to try to get customers into the bar. Like she fucking hustles, man. She works nonstop, does a bunch of fucking shows. She's come to Lebanon. She's done a lot of shows here. She's open for Gad and Malay. She's open for Mo Amer in the U.S. Like, dude, Natalie has been fucking killing it. She's honestly absolutely been killing it. I think she's going to go. She's going to be fucking huge, man. So she is hands down one of the funniest Lebanese comics. A quick funny fun fact about Natalie is when I saw her perform in the States, I was kind of and she, I, I haven't told her this before. I don't know if anyone else has. She's developed like this weird comic laugh where when another stand up comic will say something funny, you'll just hear Natalie in the back going like, hey, hey, something. It's, it was weird. It was it was a weird laugh, Natalie, but I like it. And um, I also had a crush on you. So. So there you have it. That is my top five uh, favorite Lebanese stand-up comedians. Uh, please let me know if I missed one of your favorite comics. Write down their names. I'd love to check them out. And if you don't know some of the comics that I mentioned, please check them out. I'm sure you're, you're familiar with a lot of them. But if you don't, I highly recommend them. They're really, really funny and really talented. And I'm super happy for all of them, honestly. And I, and I can't wait to see sort of where they take Lebanese stand-up comedy five years from now. All right, it's time for one of my favorite uh, segments, the Netflix top 10 in Lebanon. Let's break it down quickly, and I'm going to give you guys some amazing recommendations. Three Netflix recommendations and then a few movie recommendations off Netflix. Quickly breaking down the top 10 in Lebanon, let us start with... And the number one spot is the movie called Below Zero. It is a Spanish movie. have not seen it. It just entered the top 10. Uh, looks interesting. It's about like a cop transporting a bunch of people in a truck and shit goes wrong number two lupin still holding steady in the top three it's been in the top three now for three weeks i think right yeah pretty impressive uh dropping from number one last week to number three is fate of the winx saga still haven't seen it still not gonna see it bridgerton again holding steady in the top five it's been like three weeks it's at number four and number five 50 meters squared it is a turkish series a one season long uh, it's about like a criminal hiding out in a small town, something like that. I haven't seen it. I'm not going to see it. Number six, The Dig. It is a brand new movie starring uh, Carrie Mulligan and Ray Fiennes. I actually watched it yesterday. Quite enjoyed it, to be honest with you. Really good movie. I love Carrie Mulligan. I'm a huge fan of hers. This was a really good movie. Uh, hour and 52 minutes. Period drama. Um, did not feel like two hours. Not very heavy on conflict. Just a very good film. I liked it. Number seven, Mile 22, starring Mark Wahlberg as like a sniper. Looks, look, I, I haven't seen it, not going to see it. Number eight, Den of Thieves. This was in the top five last week. It is still in the top ten. Uh, haven't seen it. Number nine, uh, The Bureau of Magical Creatures. The Bureau of Magical Things. Uh, this sounds like a ripoff of like Harry Potter, uh, a series of unfortunate events, all that shit. What is it? Is, is, is it a series? One season for kids, magical, quirky. And at number 10, Finding Ohana, which is a comedy, original Netflix film uh, that takes place in Hawaii. Looks pretty stupid. So that is the top 10. So let me give you guys a few recommendations. One of them is actually in the top 10, which is The Dig. I thought it was an awesome movie, so highly recommend you guys see it. Another movie that is on Netflix that I would recommend you guys watching is First Reformed. It is a movie about a priest uh, starring Ethan Hawke. I don't want to give much away. It is basically a priest who gets involved with this couple of, um, of environmental activists. And the story just gets darker and darker. It is honest. I've been wanting to watch that movie for like two years. I finally pulled the trigger on it last week and thoroughly enjoyed it. So check out uh, First Reformed on Netflix. It's a very good movie. And I just finished watching Night Stalker on Netflix. It's a true crime documentary series about... The Night Stalker is like this infamous serial killer in Los Angeles, 1985. Um, I'm normally not into stories that glorify these serial killers, but it is honestly very well made. It's a very slick documentary. It's crazy how fucking long the guy was able to dodge the police and how many people he murdered. So if you're into that, I would recommend you watch that series also on Netflix. It's like four or five episodes, a limited series. In terms of movies, I watched a bunch of fucking awesome movies last week. These are not on Netflix, but you can find them... 
you, they're all out on home video, most of them now. So you can either rent them, you can get the DVD, stuff like that. You can stream them online. I saw Sound of Metal on Amazon. Um, it is, it's a fucking amazing movie. It is directed by Darius Martyr. It is about a drummer who starts losing his hearing. It is such a great drama. The lead performance by Riz Ahmed is incredible. The whole cast is incredible, to be honest with you. Um, can't recommend this movie enough. Sound of Metal, check it out. Minari, it is, the it is the story of a Korean family that moves to Arkansas in the 1950s to start a farm. So it is like the American dream movie, the t quintessential American dream movie starring this Korean family. It is directed by Lee Isaac Chung. It, star it stars a Steven Yen from, uh, from The Walking Dead. I absolutely loved this movie. It is, hand it is absolutely in my top three best movies of 2020. I cannot recommend it enough. It is sweet. It's emotional. It's touching. It, it opens honestly like a studio... Ghibli movie. The first 15 minutes felt like a Studio Ghibli movie. I cannot recommend it enough. Another movie that I also cannot recommend enough is Another Round starring Mads Mikkelsen. It is from director Thomas Vinterberg. He's the guy who made The Hunt a few years ago, are also starring Mads Mikkelsen. Uh, Another Round is fantastic. Just in a nutshell, the plot revolves around a history professor who has fallen out of love, I would say, like with life. He's kind of lost his spark and his spunk. And he and his friends try an experiment involving alcohol to see if it can affect his personality, his work, their personality. I, I already feel like I've given away too much. It is a fantastic, feel great movie that is also very touching and it could be very sad. One of the best of the year. Fucking amazing. The final movie that I want to recommend is Promising Young Woman, again starring Carrie Mulligan from The Dig. It is directed by first time director uh, Emerald Fennell. It is a fucking amazing movie about a woman who wants to get revenge on men, basically. And um, I'm not going to share much more than that. It is a harrowing story. It is hilarious. It is shocking. It is scary sometimes. Carrie Mulligan gives an absolutely amazing performance. This is such a great directorial debut by Emerald Fennell. So again, I don't think you can go wrong with this movie. All right, now you have a bunch of movies and a bunch of series to keep you guys busy for the next few days. If you've seen some of these, let me know in the comments. Keep it spoiler free, but let me know if you guys like them. If you have any recommendations to make, please leave your thoughts in the comments below. Um, okay, so as you guys know, every week I've been breaking down a sort of Lebanese influencer that I really like. And this week, I wanted to talk about two people who are better known as Kazdura, George Khalaf and Stefania Atalla. Now, uh, full disclosure, I was one of the original producers when Kazdura first launched. I was there since day one when George was just hosting it by himself. Uh, I was instrumental in recommending Stefania Atalla to be George's co-host. I'm going to remind you of that every day, George. Never forget. I'm always going to take credit for that. Uh, so I, I've been there since, since like day one. I know George a lot more than I know Steph, to be completely fair. I've, I've hung out with George countless times. I've seen Stefania Atalla once, maybe twice. We're friendly on like social media and stuff, but I've never, I've very rarely interacted with her. But she seems very genuine. She's very funny. And I, she's been such a great addition to the show. And, um, and I think the show has honestly managed, it, the show has been fucking going. And I think we don't realize it for like, Five years now, four or five years, and it consistently scores a huge audience. And I think it is mostly due to the chemistry between George and Steph. They're adorable together. They're lovable. We all love them. And I have a particular soft spot for George because I just know George so well. By the way, if you guys don't know George, I have a funny story about George. If you guys have seen that XXL commercial on TV where George is like, you know, Monique. Monique. With Elias Zayik. Uh, that ad made George incredibly fucking popular. Once we were walking in City Mall, like three years ago, and I, I shit you not, a lady stopped George, gave him her baby to hold, and George took a photo with her baby like he's the fucking Pope because of the XXL commercial. I shit you not, we're all like fucking looking dumbstruck. Like, what's, is he fucking carrying a baby? That is, that is literally a true story. Um... I honestly love those guys. Their show is, they're so down to earth. They drive around, they get food and all that. But I find that secondary, honestly, the whole driving around, getting food to just their chemistry. And now I'm going to be a little bit real with George and Steph. And please don't hate me. And I've had this conversation with George in private, but it's time to make it public to put a little bit of pressure on George. Now, they're both busy. Steph is busy. She's a very busy actress. And George is a very busy producer. And they both have a lot on, on their hands. 
But I do think they got lazy with Kazdura. And I'm just going to be real with you guys. I think George and Steph have a huge audience. And I think that George and Steph have relied a bit too much on the let's get in the car and let's go get food gimmick. Look, it worked for the first three, four years. At this point, we're in a country where getting in a car and going to get food is kind of weird and, and like kind of impossible. A, most restaurants are closing. A lot of people can't afford to go get food anymore. So I think that just the concept of the show at this point, I'm not, I'm not trying to shit on it. It's, it's hard. Like, I understand if they're, if they're having a hard time making episodes, I understand why it's hard to make a show during these times, which is why I've told George before. And now I'm going to say it publicly, start a goddamn podcast with you and Steph. Dude, if I had an audience and if people liked me as much as they like you and Steph, I would have done a podcast like years ago, dude. You guys have a massive audience. And again, people don't tune in to watch you guys eat and give generally always a positive review because you guys are nice and you don't want to talk shit about the restaurant. So give the people what they want. A George and Steph show where you guys sit and talk for like 30 minutes to an hour. I guarantee you it will be successful. There are people that are way less likable than you guys and way less charismatic than you guys doing fucking podcasts out there when you guys should be doing it. When I guarantee you, you guys would have a massive audience. You would have one of the most popular podcasts in Lebanon. I, I honestly could guarantee it. I would put money on it. All you need to do, get a couple of mics each of you and do zoom calls with good quality audio and you have yourselves a podcast problem solved love you guys love Kazdura. i'm gonna keep watching till the day i die you know i hope they can figure out how to deal with the current situation because it's not easy you know it's hard for anyone to make content right now uh so oops yeah so george and steph and with that we have reached the end of episode four of do not worry thank you so much for joining me once again uh this is honestly the most comfortable i felt recording any of these episodes so I, i'll take that as a good sign it was pretty chill today had a pretty good time doing it i'm usually very stressed to be honest with you guys so much is going through my head are they gonna like it are they gonna watch it are they gonna click etc uh felt pretty chill today thank you guys so much again for watching for liking for commenting if you have not subscribed to the channel please subscribe like i said i am now unemployed i need your help y'all let's hit a thousand subscribers let's get this channel monetized i appreciate all of you thank you so much uh you can find all the links for the audio uh platforms like enrami uh, google podcasts deezer spotify all that stuff in the description below you can find my Twitter links, Instagram, all that stuff down in the down in the description. Click all the links, click all the socials. Thank you so much, everybody. And as usual, do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry.